Hey everyone, this is Josh Burton doing a lecture on pulmonary embolism in five-ish minutes. So with that being said, let's get started. Working from the bottom uh, to the top, we'll start with the deep venous thrombosis as these are significant risk factors for pulmonary embolisms. <clears throat> when we do these bedside ultrasounds looking for DVTs, typically we're evaluating the femoral and popliteal veins, specifically common femoral, superficial femoral, and popliteal. Uh, there's two types, provoked and unprovoked. Provoked being recent surgeries, trauma, immobility, and active cancers. So when we are talking or taking a history of the patient, we're asking for these things. And there's also unprovoked DVTs to be aware of as well. One other thing to add on this slide is there are um, superficial venous thrombosis that happen in the saphenous veins. Um, if the thrombus is within five centimeters of the deep venous system, then these need to be treated like DVTs as well. Or if the thrombus is more than five centimeters of the affected vein, these also need to be treated like uh, of DVT. So again, these typically happen at the saphofemoral or saphenyl, uh, saphenyl popliteal junctions. And again, uh, the number to remember is five. When these advance up to the lungs, uh, we're working over on this part of the uh, diagram here. So you get uh, uh, increased physiologic dead space. This results in hypoxemia, bronchoconstriction, and surfactant deficiency. And why this is important is clinically this looks like tachycardia, tachypnea, and uh, hypoxia. And that's what we're looking for that clues us into the patient having a pulmonary embolism. Depending on the size and how severe the PE is, um, is how it affects the heart. Um, so again, we ask about risk factors for VTEs. Typically, this is from like inflammatory states is the main one. That's where like Virchow's triad comes into play, um, as well as prothrombotic states, um, commonly being like a factor five laden or like a prothrombin gene mutation. Thrombotic state. PEs cause three effects on the heart. So you get RV dilation, which causes leftward septal deviation. Um, this is what we look for on our bedside echocardiograms. This then reduces the cardiac output, um, which if we slide over this direction, decreases coronary blood flow, decreases RVO2 supply, and then re results in RV ischemia. Um, and that's kind of the cycle that happens. And so as this keeps spiraling through with reduced cardiac output and increasing RV ischemia, you get this uh, right ventricular uh, spiral of death that leads to then shock uh, and ultimately uh, death. <clears throat> When we talk to these patients uh, and are evaluating them, so history and physical exam, we typically ask these um, these questions. So is there associated shortness of breath? Is there pleuritic chest pain, cough, wheezing? We typically ask about hemoptysis, but again, this is only about 13% um, of patients. On physical exam, be sure to document and look for vital sign abnormalities, being the tachypnea and the tachycardia, looking for signs of DVT. Um, decreased breath sounds and fever also um, shows up here as a physical exam finding for pulmonary embolisms, but again, it's pretty rare. Only 3% um, of these patients have that. <clears throat> After we've taken the history of physical exam and we're trying to figure out how to work up these patients, um, these are three clinical decision-making tools that are really helpful um, when you're deciding what to order. Um, the D-dimer is obviously um, pretty controversial in the emergency department. Um, some people order them, some people don't. Um, so this is how you do it. Um, if you are worried that the patient has a PE, meaning that we're trying to rule in a pulmonary embolism, what we're going to use is the Wells criteria. And the purpose of the Wells criteria is to rule in a pulmonary embolism. This assesses pretest probability, meaning that we're worried about a PE and we're going to choose a test, uh, either a D-dimer or a CT angiogram of, uh, with PE protocol. It's typically done in a two-tier model. So if the well score is zero to four, we say PE is unlikely and we'll uh, move forward with the D-dimer. If it's greater than four, then we say PE is likely and we move forward with CT angiogram with PE protocol. Uh, the YEARS algorithm is a good one to follow up with as well. So the D-dimer cutoff is about 500. Um, to reduce um, false positives, um, this is where 
uh, the year's algorithm comes into play. So if the D-dimer is elevated and is between like 500 and 1,000 and you still say, man, this patient is still pretty low risk for a PE, <coughs> the year's algorithm can be used um, to help out. So if the patient has a low well score plus a D-dimer that is less than 1,000, the year's algorithm is effective at ruling out a PE without imaging and increasing that D-dimer from 500 to 1,000. And again, this is the patient that um, does not have clinical signs of a DVT, no hemoptysis, and PE is not the most likely diagnosis. <clears throat> when we use the PERC rule, so this is the patient that um, after history and physical exam, we're thinking, man, this really doesn't sound like a PE. Um, I don't think the patient has a pulmonary embolism. What else can I do to further risk gratify this patient? Um, to say that we do not need to um, perform testing for, P, for a PE, and that's the PERC rule. So this is applied to low-risk patients by physician Gestalt. It helps rule out a PE down to a less than 2% chance of a pulmonary embolism. So if the patient is PERC negative, no further workup is required. So the PERC rule rules out a PE, and that's how these three clinical decision-making tools are used. <clears throat> The next step is your workup. Um, so pulmonary embolisms fall under the chest pain differential. This would include a CBC, BMP, cardiac enzymes. CBC and BMP, you're looking for like other things on the differential. Troponin, this is a marker of right heart strain, which becomes important when we classify PEs as well as a BNP as well. EKG, the most common abnormality is a sinus tachycardia, but there's also the S1, Q3, T3 abnormality, the T-wave inversions in the precordial leads, as well as evidence of a right bundle branch block. Chest x-ray, a couple um, things to note for like board review and questions are Hampton's hump and Westermark sign. CT angiogram is the gold standard imaging to use. Um, bottom left, this is the patient I recently had. The pulmonary embolism is right here. And this is her echocardiogram that we performed at bedside. Um, things we look for is septal bowing. So going back to looking for signs of RV heart strain or RV uh, failure. Um, if you see that flattening of the septum, like what we do here, um, then that shows, or at least gives us a clue that uh, this pulmonary embolism is large enough to be causing strain on the heart. This is how we classify pulmonary embolisms. So working at the top, so PEA arrest, PE is one of the causes of this. So if is it a cardiac arrest coming in from a pulmonary embolism, treatment of choice is thrombolytics. If the pulmonary embolism is massive, meaning that uh, this has now affected uh, vital signs and they're in a shock state, um, they'll require thrombolytics. If it's a submassive PE, um, this is normal vital signs with evidence of right heart strain, either like an abnormal troponin, elevated BNP, or abnormalities on the echocardiogram um, or EKG. Then we do anticoagulation. For the vast majority of this, it is anticoagulation. There are studies that say, oh, sorry. <coughs> that we can do thrombolytics as well, but this is still somewhat con controversial, um, but I will include that there. Um, Subsegmental pulmonary embolism, so these are the stable vital signs. Um, some will require anticoagulation. Um, there are studies that say that they can have a period of observation if they're of low risk for recurrent VTEs, um, and that obviously goes along with close follow-up with their PCP. Um, Kind of weird to send a patient home with a pulmonary embolism. Usually we get pretty worried about these. Um, so one more decision tool that I will add on uh, this portion is something called the PESI score. Um, the PESI score is pulmonary severity index. And what this does is determine prognosis of the PE and if the patient can be managed as an outpatient versus an inpatient. So that is a good one to use as well. If you're considering um, uh, discharge home or having a hard time disposition in this patient. Other treatment modalities that need to be included in, in a, a patient with a pulmonary embolism is obviously correcting the hypoxemia, um, either with high flow nasal cannula, BiPAP, intubation. Um, we try to stay away from IV fluids because this increases preloads and increases RV dilation. And like what we talked about before, if this causes further septal bowing, uh, further redu uh, reductions in cardiac output, we could technically make things worse. Um, so we try to stay away from that. Um, if the patient is in shock and needs blood pressure management, the vasopressors of choice are norepinephrine, dobutamine, and vasopressin. The reason for these is they have uh, the least effect on pulmonary vascular resistance. And obviously we're trying to reduce that as much as possible. 
And then the fourth one down on the list is to reduce pulmonary vascular resistance, and this is, and this is done by uh, reducing clot burden, either with thrombolytics or anticoagulation therapy. All right, that's everything. Thanks.